I hope that I hope this talk will end up being like some sort of a rampage of some sort. And so the next, <laughs> seriously, I hope there's some. So this next I will get. I mean, well, I guess of no. I mean, the title could not be more blunt. Like, what the what the hell happened, Ron Taylor? Thanks, Ming. Yeah, so I want to set the uh, expectations really low. I've got, I've got, I've gotten about 12 hours of sleep over the last three days, like most of you. So, uh, so who am I? Uh, my name's Ron Taylor. Um, I've been in security for about 20 years on the offensive and defensive side, doing a little bit of everything. Um, you can find me on Twitter under uh, Gus Gorman. Uh, does anyone know where that the gut name Gus Gorman comes from? Come on. It's like one of the earliest hackers in movies. Richard Pryor played the, the character. Superman. Superman. Yep, that's right. So that's where it comes from. Uh, you can also find me on MySpace. On the Gus one. You guys don't use MySpace? It's coming back. I'm telling you right now. But, um... I've uh, oh, so so I I say that I've been a hacker for 39 years because my mom says I've been breaking shit since I was born. It's <laughs> probably right. Um, actually, I got to update that. Unfortunately, in a couple weeks I turned 40. Sad. Um, I'm a member of the Packet Hacking Village. Like Ming said, we do a lot of work here to um, uh, you know be ready for the 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 talks, the present, the the challenges, and everything. And we appreciate you guys coming out and making it success successful. I also run a B-Sides conference in Raleigh, so if anyone's in, in that general area, reach out to me. We'd love to have you come or speak there. So, what we're here for. First of all, I need to give you a disclaimer. Uh, so, I first want to start out by saying that in no way am I bashing the boots on the ground people involved with OPM. We all know that it comes to, when it comes to information security, even if you want to do the right thing, a lot of times it's not possible. Uh, whether it's financial reasons or, uh, you know, political reasons. But, you know, we've all been this, in a situation where we, we've, we've been financially or politically hindered from doing the right thing. So, so if anyone's ever worked for OPM or does work for, for OPM, please don't take offense to this. Uh, we all know that it's likely someone above your pay grade made the decisions that led to this catastrophe. It's a really long week. <laughs> so, first of all, who is OPM? Um, OPM is the Office of Personnel Management. They are the human resources division for um, the civilian agencies in the federal government. They do a few other things. Um, in 2005, they took um, the responsibility on to do background checks for the Department of Defense. Well, they took it from the Department of Defense uh, S uh, Security Service before that's DSS was who was doing it, right? So, you know, that data is kind of key because you'll see while we go through this, there's um, a lot of, uh, you know, things that happened during that time frame. So what was lost in the breach? A lot, uh, 21.5 21 million SF-86 forms, okay? So wh what is an SF-86 form? Has anyone here filled out an SF-86 form? Yeah, if you've ever tried to work for the government, uh, if you've ever just filled out an application, didn't even get the job, that, that, that's in their database, okay? That was lost. Uh, it has a lot of information in there. Information about your man, family members, uh, um, friends, psychological information. Uh, well, I'll show you the next slide a little bit more about that. But aside from that, um, 4.2 million personnel files containing information, um, essentially, uh, you know, all all of your your personal information about your military records, things like that. And on top of it, uh, 5.6 million sets of fingerprints. So why is that bad? You can't change that, right? Yeah, you lose the username and password. 
You can change that. You can't change your fingerprints. So now 5.6 million people, their fingerprint data is essentially compromised, right? So, you know, when we talk about uh, the next generation of, of, uh, of, of authentication, um, how, how can we really trust biometrics or fingerprints for biometrics? You can't. Uh, so that's a big problem. No, on the bottom here, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, the CIA actually does not use OPM for their data breaches, or for their data breaches. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, of course they don't. For their background investigations. So it's interesting, but, you know, one of the, the articles that I read kind of pointed out something interesting that uh, the fact that they didn't, um, you know, if someone, whoever has this data, could essentially discern from uh, that information, you know, if this person is not in the, in the database that I just stole, then that may mean they work for the CIA. So um, uh, there's a, there was a report that right after the breach, uh, a lot of the CIA folks were pulled out of places like China, you know. Do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's interesting. So uh, a little bit more about the SF eighty six. Shoot, you can't see that red very well. Um, <clears throat> so to get a security clearance, you have to fill out an SF eighty six form. Um, I think the key things. There's a lot of information on here, and it's not meant to really go through all of it. But I think the key things is the the investigations. They're they're designed to identify the type of information that could be used to coerce someone, right? To, to find out, is, is there a way that I can coerce, coerce them into betraying my country? Okay, that's, that's what the SF-86 is for. Um, and the, it, it also, it asks, infer, it, asks, it asks individuals to turn over the most personal data, de details about their, their life, right? So, I mean, you can kind of understand how this information, start thinking about how this information might be used against you, right? Um, th these are just some things out of the report, which we'll talk about, but um, some, some quotes from, so James Comey, uh, he's someone who is fairly well now, known now. Um, but, uh, you know, he said that it lists, the SF-86 lists every place he's ever lived since he was 18, his family members, siblings, um, all their information, of course. So it's not just that individual person who filled out the SF-86, it's all their friends and family members that are affected by it as well. So, bad news. Um, <clears throat> so here's where we're gonna start kind of drawing other assertions about how this data is being used. So around the same time, there were a few other breaches that happened, large data breaches. Uh, so first of all, USIS uh, it was an OPM contractor that uh, was actually doing background investigation stuff for OPM. They were breached in 2014, lost a ton of information. Uh, in December 2014, the other OPM contractor that they used was also breached. Okay, so. You know, I mean, there should have been some sort of indication that <laughs> that OPM was a target around this time, right? Uh, Anthem, Primera, uh, Empire, all, these are all other breaches that happen in these, these same uh, companies. They provide services for, um, uh, for the government, right? So more information that they're pulling together. Of course, Ashley Madison. Who was affected by the Ashley Madison breach? Anyone? <laughs> oh. I know you were, Greg. I know that guy was right there. <laughs> um, well, this is it's important, and I'll tell you why in a second. And then, of course, uh, uh, between 2012 and 2015, that time frame, the OPM breach happened. So if you look at this, uh, this was from, I think, the Washington Post. I should have you know, looked into it more. But anyway, the, the person in the article kind of made this assertion that um, what they're doing is they're taking all these data breaches and they're pulling all the information together so that they can correlate between them and say, hey, this person over here, I, 
matches this person in this data breach that I found, um, how can we use that information against them, right? So if they, the, the SF86 form says this person has, you know, a, a wife and three kids and lives, you know, wherever, this is his wife's information, uh, and then he goes over to the Ashley Madison database and finds that same guy's information, he can coerce him basically by saying, uh, hey, I'm going to tell your wife you're cheating on her, right? Uh, I mean, that's just one example of, of how this information can be used. But what they're doing is they're essentially building a dossier about each person in those databases, right? All that information is pulled into a database, likely, um, and used, will be used in some way. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about whether it's not, whether it's being used and if we have any clues of how it's being used. Um, but uh, you can get an idea of, based on the, the different, different information that's been stolen, uh, what's out there, right? So, <clears throat> let's talk about the report. The majority of the information that, that, that's here and I'm going to talk about is based on this report. Um, it's all open information, public information. I don't have any insider information at all, uh, but, I, but, I, but I think it's really interesting. I started talking to a lot of folks about the, who had been affected by it, and they really didn't, you know, we talked about this report. They really had no idea the Im impact of it. So that's kind of how this, this you know, this, this uh, talk came about was you know, they didn't realize how, how bad, um, you know, OPM screwed up. And then that's kind of what we're going to talk about. So, um, actually, let me back up. So the report came out in December of 2016, right? So just last year. And uh, it was done by the House Oversight Committee. This is the same group who investigated, like, Benghazi and things like that, okay? So they took, I think, three years, two and a half years, to go through and investigate everything that happened um, and to determine, you know, kind of a timeline. So that's what we're going to talk about first is that timeline. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about the timeline here, uh, I, I don't want you to think, you know, that they actually, this is when they found out the information. Most of what they found out was after the report, after they did an investigation, okay? Um, because they really they, they weren't monitoring anything. So first of all, the 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 warnings were there. Okay, the warnings were there before the breach. First of all, since early on, I think uh, 2007 was probably the first time when they were really talking about APTs, and you know the government was warning agencies, hey, there's these the, there's these these threats out there. You need to be concerned about right. But going back to 2005, the Inspector General, um, who's you know internal to OPM, the Inspector General was 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 telling them, "Hey, you are you have uh, you know really bad security posture. You're not doing two-factor authentication. Um, you know things like that." And over and over again, uh, over the years, you can see from 2005 to 2007, and then in 2008 and 2009, 2010, they continued to raise that, uh, that alert level, saying, hey, you really need to do something here, okay? They ignored it. And that's what we're going to talk about is exactly, you know, what happened. So, hopefully this all works out. I hate animations, but this was, uh, this was a fun one to do. So, 2000, July 2012. So this is where the first uh, known adversary access to the network. Now, they didn't find it in 2012, of course. They didn't realize this until they did forensics. And I think that the, 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 you know, they actually found a piece of malware that, that tied, it, tied them back to 2012. That's how they figured out that um, you know, that was likely when they first got in. Between November and December 2013, um, I don't know the specific inf specific information. They likely had found some sort of log or uh, timestamp on, on on a piece of malware 
that indicated that they were moving around in the network, right? Um, so that time frame was, was, was where they realized, okay, someone is actually, you know, in their network. Now, again, they didn't realize it at that time. They, you know, this is from the investigation. Uh, March two, 2014, um, the U.S. CERT notifies OPM and says, hey, um, your data is out there on the Internet. <laughs> so someone is exfilling data from your network. So at that point, OPM actually did start to monitor their network, right? And they identified uh, Adversary 1. In the report, I think that, that they call it something else, but Adversary 1, um, uh, uh, that was the first, that's when they started monitoring them, okay? At the same time, while they're monitoring them, like literally they're watching them exfiltrate data, but they're like, well, that's not information, it's not really inf important information. Um, they weren't, they were monitoring, monitoring them to see how close they got to like the background databases, okay? But they said, okay, that's not that big of a deal. And uh, they were coming up with a plan to, you know, kill them, get, you know, get them out of their network. But at the same time, they did exfiltrate some data. What that data was, was essentially the blueprints to their network. It had network diagrams, usernames, passwords, things like that, right? It was all the information that they needed to continue their attack, right? I mean, these, this... Just keep in mind this attack happened over many years, and that's usually how, you know, APT type attacks work, right? I mean, they get in, they start moving around, they escalate privileges, they try to stay stealth, um, exfiltrate data when they can, just try not to get caught. So now they have enough information to continue moving through the network. They know they can, they know where the crown jewels are. They just need to get there. <clears throat> So around that same time, May uh, 2014, a second adversary, which likely is connected, we'll talk about that later. Can you guys hear me okay? Like, I feel like this mic is like, okay, good. Yeah, Do I even need the mic? It sounds better there. This is better. No, when you're up close. Okay, you need the mic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll try. I hate, I hate holding mics. Um, so anyway, uh, around that time, they gained another foothold, Okay. Now, remember, the contractors had been already breached at this point, okay? What OPM was doing was to, to give their contractors access to the network, they were giving them a username and password to VPN in, connect into their network. Well, likely what Adversary 2 did was use that information to access the uh, OPM network. Uh, which they later figured out that uh, it was, oops, sorry, let me back up. So they gained a foothold, got into the network. So now at this point, if they kick out the other guy, it's okay because they have another, they have another foothold. And the, 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 other, the other point about this foothold is that they look like a normal user. Okay, they're logging in from, you know, using credentials of a contractor. So that's bad, okay. What would have fixed that? Two-factor authentication, maybe? Well, they weren't doing that. <clears throat> they, uh, their master plan to uh, mitigate this issue with, with adversary one was called the Big Bang, okay? And they, uh, when they noticed the adversary one getting closer to the crown jewels, then they executed this plan and, you know, kicked him off the network. But... As we know, it doesn't really matter because they already had other footholds. And they weren't monitoring those. So between June and August of 2014, um, Adversary 2 starts moving throughout the network. Okay? He gets to the point where he's found the in investigation data and starts exfiltrating that out of our network, out of their network. And uh, so at that point, they, they, the, the data was out there, okay? And OPM has to come out and say, okay, we, we acknowledge that there was a breach 
Um, actually, it was more in res like it says here in response to a press reports because people found out, hey, <laughs> I think OPM has a breach. They didn't want to talk about it, but eventually they had to kind of own up to it. But um, they didn't really say, oh, yeah, we lost background data. Matter of fact, what they did was they said, oh, it's just some old manuals. It, it wasn't you know, really important information, so don't worry about it. Okay. Um, they only thought that the network diagrams and the manuals were the only things stolen at that point? They were eager to the fact that Actor 2 had actually exfiltrated that data? So yeah, it's, it, it's still, it's still kind of unclear as to exactly what they knew. Um, but, uh, yeah, most likely they, they knew that. I mean, after the investigation, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And here's the thing. <clears throat> I should have put this in my disclaimer. There's a lot of political aspects to this, this situation. I'm not going to get into that stuff. Um, I think it's 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 worth you guys reading the the report. Uh, it's only 240 something pages, but it's a page turner. Let me tell you, it's actually really interesting. But it's that information is in there too, where they kind of make um, you know they talk about the political aspect of it and exactly why um, decisions were made and who lied to who and things like that. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so moving forward in December 2014, um, you know, they've, they've <laughs> pilfered the OPM network at this point, got all the information they needed there, and they finally made their way over to the uh, Department of Interior's data center, uh, and this is where they um, were started exfiltrating personnel data records, okay? That's where all that stuff was stored. Um, so they exfiltrate da that data. In March 2016, so like OPM at this point, they have no idea, right? They thought, hey, we got this guy out, no big deal, right? Um, everything's good. They, didn't mo they weren't monitoring anything. They didn't put any extra controls in place to, um, you know, to, to make sure that no one else is in their network. At this point, they still think, hey, we kicked that guy out. We know what we're doing, right? Well, they didn't, okay? And they continued to pilfer even more information. They found fingerprint databases, like we said. Um, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's pretty serious. In uh, April of 2015, uh, an IT contractor essentially at the, stumbles upon something that might be interesting, okay? They, you know, they weren't monitoring anything. They didn't have the controls in place to figure out, you know, is there an insider threat? Is, so, is there a compromised machine on my network? They, had, they didn't really know, okay? So they stumbled upon it. And the way that he stumbled upon it was uh, there was a, um, a call out to opmsecurity.org. Sounds legit, right? But this guy actually, he knew. He said, wait, we don't have that domain. That's kind of weird. So, you know, they, this, at that point, they start investigating it because they said something's wrong here, you know. Um, and, uh, well, at that point, you know, they had the oh shit moment, right? And uh, they said, okay, we got a problem. Um, they're still in our network and they've been there for a long time. So we need, to, we need some help. <clears throat> so moving forward. Uh, April 2016, at that point, they actually called in Silence. Um, they had been working with Silence in the past, and uh, they just decided, well, we're not going to deploy their, their, their uh, protection tools. Okay? They could have, and back in 2014, uh, there, there, were plan there, um, there were people who were saying, hey, we need to put this in place, but they didn't. Even though they knew that there were adversaries in their network, they knew that they were a target. Um, they didn't do it. Uh, and like I said, was, was whether or not that was political, politically motivated, uh, it's different. Uh, and then, of course, pretty quickly, once they realized, hey, we, we've got a problem, now we need help, we need, some, we need to get this person out of the network, of course, they, they deployed the solution, um, you know, the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, silence, uh, uh, protect, and started identifying stuff. And I, I like this quote right here. 
<laughs> the the engineer that came in from Silence, he said it literally the tool lit up like a Christmas tree. Like they found so much stuff like within you know within hours that it just lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, so <laughs> of course I'm sure they had another oh shit moment there too. <laughs> Um, in uh, May 20, 20th, uh, 2015, uh, OPM, of course, now at this point, they've determined, uh, yeah, we've got a problem. We've got malware all over our network. People have owned us left and right. Uh, I think we have to notify Congress. <laughs> because they, you know, they actually have a requirement to notify Congress when uh, something like this happens, which is likely why they were downplaying it for so long. So they notify Congress on May 27th. Uh, OPM briefs the media. So at this point, they, they come out and they say, listen, we're sorry. We're so sorry. We, uh, you know, we lost your data. Um, it's about 4.2 million records. Of course, we know now it was a lot more than that. Okay. And uh, they kind of downplay it the whole time, right? You know, they're trying to downplay it, not make it seem so serious. Um, at this point, uh, so U.S. CERT comes in, and you know they're doing their investigation as well, and they also realize, hey, uh, it's not just this 4.2 million, um, you know, records. There's also background data investigation that was stolen. Another oh shit moment. <laughs> uh, at that point, uh, the director, who was uh, Director uh, Archuleta, she uh, says, okay. Yeah, we lost the background data information too, um, so she's she's kind of forced to uh, acknowledge that. <clears throat> so, in June, after 74 days of deployment of the Silence Protect software, they deployed it on uh, 10,000 something computers. They found 2,000 pieces of malware. Nearly one for every. One piece of malware for every five computer devices. That's a lot of malware on a network. And who, know, who knows how long it was there, right? Now we know after the investigation, the first piece they found in 2012, um, you know, uh, if you work in defense, you know time to remediation, time to detection is, is key. If, it, if you don't find it within, you know, within hours, likely uh, they've already started taking your data, okay, and gaining a better foothold. So, their network's completely rooted at this point. Um, it's owned. What do they do? Okay, I would pull the plug, but you know, at this point, it's, you know, what's the point? But uh, in uh, July, OPM comes out and says, "Hey, yeah, we we need to update that number. <laughs> it wasn't as small as we thought. It was actually 21.5 million uh, people compromised." And of course, July 10th. Uh, Director Archuleta resigns. Very convenient. Uh, September 23rd, OPM updates the uh, estimate about the fingerprints because originally they said, yeah, it was like 1.1 million fingerprints. Now they say, no, it's actually about 5 million. But, you know, give or take a couple million, what does it matter, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, prior to testifying before the committee, um, the CIO, Donna Seymour, resigns. So again, that's convenient, which delayed the investigation because now she's not there. Um, anyway, I won't go. I won't talk. I won't. I won't go down that rat hole. <laughs> um, but like I said, read the, read the report. Uh, this is more information, interesting information there. Okay. So again, from the report, the key findings. Uh, they had, uh, first of all, they didn't, they failed to prioritize their data. In 2005, they took on all this background information um, uh, investigation. They took on the responsibility of doing the background investigation and storing it, right? They had to secure it. That was their responsibility. Um, but they never changed, when they did that, they never changed their security posture. They never said, hey, we have really even more uh, important information. Uh, we we need to secure it better. We need to put other mechanisms in place. Uh, so that, you know that's a that's a key finding there. Multi-factor authentication. So I think 
the federal government started requiring multi-factor authentication, I don't know, 2005, 2007. Um, if anyone, uh, you know, is involved with like DISA STIGs and requirements like that, uh, you know, it's been there for a long time, okay? They weren't doing it, you know? The Inspector General said since 2005, hey, you got to do this, you got to put this in place. They still didn't, okay? And even after this compromise in 2015, they still hadn't done it. I mean, come on. <laughs> Use names and passwords to get stolen. They knew that they were stolen, okay? But they still didn't put this in place. So that's, that's a pretty serious thing, right? To me, it's negligence. Um, they didn't encrypt the database. <laughs> I mean, they've, they've, yeah. So that's what they said. They said, well, and actually, if you, if you can go on YouTube and watch the proceedings from when uh, Congress was grilling them, and some of it's really, really ent ent entertaining, but uh, they essentially said, well, um, our systems are too old to do encryption. <laughs> okay, well, that's a problem, we get that, but it still doesn't mean it's okay, right? I mean, uh, this is information that that, that if stolen can affect lots of lives in different ways. So again, another major finding that they weren't encrypting anything. Um, yeah, so this, I kind of already said this, legacy systems was their excuse. So like I said, they, uh, they, 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 they just didn't, they didn't listen to the Inspector General. Another thing you'll find in the report is that there really wasn't a good rep, uh, relationship between the Inspector General and the OPM CIO, right? Which caused a lot of political issues, and essentially they were just ignoring everything they said. The Inspector General came in and said, hey, you guys gotta do this, 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 and we recommend this. They just said, okay, whatever, we'll do it. Don't worry about it. Um, they had, they didn't even have an inventory of what was on their network. Okay, if you're in defense, you know, if you don't know it's there, you can't defend it. Okay, I mean, it's key. Visibility on your network is key. So they had no inventory of what was on their network. Okay, big problem. Uh, another key thing here, which is, you know, it's not a technical uh, finding, but what they had found was that they looked at it and they said, OPM is only spending $7 million a year on cybersecurity. They were actually at the lowest level of all the agencies, you know, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the Staples commercials, you know, where the guy's like, hey, I just saved us all this money by shopping at Staples, right? I just I think about that when, you know, they were probably like, hey, we only, we only say, we, we, our budget is really low and, you know, we don't have to, we don't spend that much money. Well, that's a problem because that just shows that they weren't putting the, you know, they, 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 didn't, they didn't value that data. They didn't see the value in spending money on cybersecurity. Um, they, they were essentially the biggest target of all the agencies and um, they, they just, they didn't protect it in that way. Two-factor authentication, uh, that was one of the, uh, the critical security controls, but there was a lot of other things. Um, I've, obviously, if they're not doing two-factor authentication, so there's a lot of other things that they probably weren't doing. Um, so this is an interesting thing. Uh, if you work in government, there's a thing called the authority to operate. It's essentially a kind of a sign-off where they say, okay, your networks, uh, your systems are up to spec, they fit, they meet the requirements. You get a sign off that says you can operate them, okay? Um, they didn't really care about that. They basically were all the systems, especially the, um, the uh, personnel investigations processing system, which is where they input all the data and everything, had no ATO, right? They were ignoring it for a long time, which is, I mean, if, if anyone uh, works in, in you know, DOD or government, you know an ATO is really important. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a big violation, put it that way. So, I thought this is a key thing, it's hard to see here, but um, 
the fact that they had no logging, I mean, they really, they had, essentially were doing no logging on the network um, or the databases. There's really no way to know um, what documents that were stolen uh, and what was, uh, you know, the, the scope of the breach. And, and another thing that they don't really point it out too much in the report, but the truth is, because they have the, they don't have the, the logging, how, who's to say that they didn't modify any data, right? And that's a whole other aspect. They could have entered some, if it's a nation state, you know, you want to get someone implanted, you can, here's, your, here's your security clearance right here, you know, you pass. Um, and they had no way to determine that because they weren't logging any of that information. So, a little scary. Um, so, uh, I skipped this slide. Oh, I guess I didn't. Uh, as far as attribution, oh no, sorry, let me back up. So, uh, the, uh, one of the, the indications, which, I like, like I said, the, the report doesn't go too technical into exactly what the malware did and you know, things like that, but um, what they identified was that it was using the malware they did find was using a uh, version of High Kit A and High Kit B, and uh, I, don't, I don't think I have a slide on it. But one of the one of the interesting things that I found was, I almost kind of feel like the the attackers weren't that sophisticated because they were hiding it in a DLL that was the name of it was linked to McAfee um, antivirus or McAfee um, um, security whatever they call it, um, and they weren't running that. Right, so the, the you know OPM wasn't even running that, and that, so that was kind of one of the indications, like that um, you know the, that there was a malware problem because they found this file and they're like, wait, it's a McAfee file. We don't run McAfee, right? But the majority of the government and DoD does run McAfee. Um, uh, I know U.S. Army. That's one of their you know main main um, endpoint protection things, right? So it's kind of standardized. So anyway, they were kind of they were guessing, but you, know, you would think that they would have done a little bit more recon to uh, determine whether what they were really running. But um, like I said, here's the other thing: was we talked about this a little bit more, but they were they were watching them take the data. Okay, uh, but the truth is, they were never able to determine how they actually got entry. Like I said, no logging. Uh, so they still don't really know how they, they, they know they were there because they saw them exfiltrating data and eventually they found that they were, they were monitoring, but they still don't know, even after all this, this investigation, how they initially got in. Likely it was a compromised machine, right? Usually it was some sort of client-side attack over the web or email or something like that. Uh, it's not too difficult to attack uh, clients. But another thing that they, you know, they, they realized too was Later on, they said, okay, um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe that, uh, that uh, the, the original data breach with the manuals and everything, maybe that really was a big problem. <laughs> so, um, you know, they, they uh, acknowledged later on that, yeah, that data was probably used to those man the manuals and things like that. It was likely used for them to continue their attacks. So, interesting stuff. Um, and, you know, because of that, they determined in the report that uh, they likely could have stopped this. When they initially were alerted to, by CERT that there was some exfiltration happening, and when OPM came out and downplayed it and said, hey, yeah, it's not that big of a deal, it's just some old, old manuals. If they had put in place protections at that point, they could have stopped it. But instead, they... They, they downplayed it, and of course, all the rest of the data was, was stolen, um, which, you know, it's, it's pretty serious. I already talked about this one here with OPM security. Um, this is one of the things that I, that I talked about a little bit, but the, the silence tools were available to them as early as June 2014, okay? And like I said, they could have put those in place, they could have deployed them, but they decided not to, okay? Even after the big bang, uh, they decided not to purchase. Uh, they were, you know, they kind of quoted it, and they, 
they ev ev evaluated it, but they said, no, nah, you know, we, uh, we think we got the guy out, so we're not going to, we're not going to buy it. Um, oh, and, and uh, so you see here, the, uh, the CEO of, of Silence said that their excuse was that there were um, political challenges on the desktop. So if any of you have worked with government or in government IT, of course, you know, there's a lot of, you know, segmentation and, and um, this group doesn't work well with this group and political reasons for not doing things. Okay, so this is one major aspect of it. Um, you know, once they put in the Silence tools, they immediately found, so I don't work for Silence, but you know, they should probably, you know, give me a t-shirt or something for talking about them. Um, but yeah, so they, you know, they, they, they implemented Silence Protect and you know, lit up like a Christmas tree. <clears throat> so as far as attribution, um, attribution is not easy. When we hear things, when I hear things on the news about, oh yeah, this attackers, they came from Russia. Um, listen, we all know that it's not easy to track things like atta these attacks back, especially if you're not doing logging and things like that. So I always think that that's, in that's interesting stuff. But what they were able to do is they essentially, they're kind of guessing, right, but based on the high kit malware, um, they said it's likely the Axiom group was, was the people who had put that there just based on the fact that it was there. It doesn't really, they don't know that for sure. Someone else could have been using that malware, of course, uh, but they attributed back to that in the report. And then um, they also said uh, that this other group, because they were involved with the WellPoint and, An and Anthem uh, uh, breaches, and, and they, they, um, they attributed it back to them as well. They said likely they're working together. So they, they, they essentially said, hey, we think these two groups were probably working together and um, you know, there's tiebacks of those groups back to nation states. So that's when they start kind of saying, okay, you know, we think it might be China or, you know. Um, so in, uh, I think it's somewhere, time, 2015 timeframe, uh, the president of China was gonna come over to visit with Obama and uh, there's a little bit of tension about this, right? Because at this point, you know, they're saying, oh, it was China. It was China, it was the nation, you know, it's China's government that hacked us. Um, whether or not that was true, we don't know. But, uh, so there's a lot of pressure and a lot of tension. So China uh, says, oh, we found them and we arrested them. <laughs> don't worry, we took care of it. <laughs> um, and, you know, but the truth is, that China's known for uh, you know, throwing people in prison for doing things that maybe they did or didn't do, um, or maybe they did something else and they said, well, let's just blame this on them so that, you know, the U.S. is happy. So anyway, it, you know, it's interesting. <clears throat> so the report continues, you know, we talked about the findings, but it goes on to make recommendations, of course, like any good report should. I know this is like a ridiculously small or, or complex slide, um, and it's meant to be because that, Honestly, the stuff in the report, most of it, the re recommendations are, um, uh, you know, political type uh, recommendations about CIOs and how you should hire them and make them accountable and make sure that the, the, they're competent. <laughs> so I thought I highlighted a few words, you know, in there, and uh, I thought that was interesting because they they really did point a lot of it back to you know, the upper management, which is good. And that's why I put that disclaimer out there at the beginning, because, um, you know, we all know that it's, it's you know, most of the decisions are above our pay grade. But they also rec recommended a, a zero trust model, you know. Um, to them, that was a new concept, but <laughs> we, know, we know it's not. Um, accountability, that was a big, that's a big piece of it, right? Um, which, you know, I thought it was funny that it was in the report because, um, you know, that you know, there really wasn't much accountability, which is a sad part because a lot of people were affected by this. A lot of people are still affected by it. I mean, if you if you had a clearance, had your SF-86 stolen, um, you know, a lot of people are looking over their shoulders. You know, if you have to travel abroad, travel to China, 
you're, you know, and you were affected, you're going to be looking over your shoulder and be a little bit paranoid. And how do you fix that? You don't. I mean, it's just it's just out there, right? Um, so it's you know, it's sad that no one was really really held accountable for uh, the what I think is the gross negligence, but. Those are the recommendations that were in the report. Um, these are kind of my recommendations of how not to become the next OPM. Uh, first of all, you have to know the value of your data, okay? You know, if you're hired into a company and, you know, your upper management that's not in IT in security says, uh, yeah, we need you to do this job, right? You know, the first thing you need to say is, okay, well, what kind of data are you holding? What, you know, what... Um, you know, what information do we need to uh, secure? And based on that, that's how you kind of start prioritizing things, right? Um, of course, there's different regulations like PCI and HIPAA and things like that. Um, regardless of those, you, you really have to know the information that, that you, you're securing and prioritize based on um, you know, based on how that is, what you're going to put in place, and where you put those controls in place. Uh, but regardless, you got to start with the basics. I mean, like we said in the report, they weren't doing encryption. Okay, encryption is not a new concept, people. Uh, you know, it's just ri ridiculous that, that they weren't encrypting their databases at all. Um, they likely weren't even encrypting. I'm sure they weren't encrypting the traffic over the network, but. Whatever it didn't, did they? They had, they just, you know, had the the keys to the front door anyway, so they went went in and stole it. So, just you know, it's information that they they needed to to secure. Two factor authentication again. Uh, that's that's pretty simple. Um, you know, that's that's something that's that's not a new concept. That's really important for uh, especially VPN type access. If you have a contractor. Uh, uh, giving out, giving them access to their network. First of all, it's something I didn't add in here, but uh, you need to evaluate your contractors. If you're letting contractors into your network, to your databases, you need to evaluate their security too. Don't just assume that they're doing the right thing. Okay, you need to just say, "Hey, you want to connect to our network." We need to know what kind of thing, what you're doing for security, and we're going to do our own audit on your network before you connect. Okay, um, so that's an important thing. Visibility, visibility is key. So, <clears throat> of course, we defend our networks. We put firewalls and intrusion prevention, and you know things like that in place. But we all know that eventually we're going to be compromised, regardless. Okay, it's no longer, uh, you know if you will, it's when you'll be compromised, okay? So having visibility in your network, um, east and west traffic, not just north-south, okay? We know if something calls us out to a C2 over our uh, edge uh, IPS, well, we might see that, but what about the traffic when they're traversing in your network? Once your system gets compromised, the first thing that they're gonna do is they're gonna pivot and they're gonna start moving laterally across the network, pulling out data, okay? How do you see that if you do not have that visibility on your network? Um, you know, I won't go into the technical details of it, but there's a lot of you know a lot of things that you can do. There's a lot of really good tools these days to be able to identify that information. So, um, and at the very least, know what's on your network. Okay. Address the roadblocks. Um, you know, this is kind of a, a political type thing, but we all have those roadblocks in our um, you know, in our, our environments as far as uh, how do I get shit done, right? How do I convince my management that I need to put in, these, these, in place these security controls? So you really need to address that stuff. And a lot of it goes back to, you know, knowing the value of your data, okay? If you can go back to your management and say, okay, listen, um, this is the type of information that, that, that we're, we need to protect and this is why, okay? This is why we're a target. Um, that goes a long way towards, uh, you know, uh, opening up those roadblocks. Um, plan for when you're after you're compromised. Most of the time, when we spend money on security controls and defense, it's defense, right? It's it's, it's we're defending our network. Uh, most of the time, that money, that bucket, 
uh, the money we spend on after, you know, the remediation, uh, the forensics, the type, that type of stuff is very low. And we usually don't think about it until after the fact. Um, so, you know, my recommendation is, uh, you know, as far as architecting your, your security solutions, think about that. Think about what would I do if I was compromised already and, and build in architect it from there. Um, <laughs> accountability. That's the last thing on there. It's really kind of complicated, right? Because, you know, how do you hold people accountable for the fails? Uh, but the truth is you have to. Um, you know, it's, it's really challenging. Uh, it, it's a really challenging concept, but you have to hold people accountable for what they're responsible for. Um, and uh, that's, that's all I got. Damn, that was perfect timing. I can't believe that. Yeah. Yes, actually, I have three or four questions, but let's start little by little. So, first thing, concerning contractors, uh, you said that uh, contractors should be security aware, etc., etc. Do you think ISO 27000 is enough to, to make sure that the contractor uh, is compliant? With no, I, I mean, I think, I think you've got to start with requirements, guidelines, things like that. But the truth is, um, it, it, it comes down to the, your data, right? It comes down to what you're, what you're securing, um, you know, to determine what the priority level, how, what the security level is. Um, because, of course, you know, everyone wants to put every, you know, uh, the best security uh, controls in place, and, but you usually don't have the money to do that, right? So what they do is sometimes they have to accept the risk. Well, based on the data that you're storing, um, that determines how much risk you can accept. Okay, one more question. May I? Yeah, yeah. Okay, how come the OPM didn't have a completely separate network storing the digital data? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's another uh, aspect that, that you know, should have been on that, that slide, the recommendation slide, you know, air gap. I mean, when it comes to stuff like that, uh, if your network or if your data is that that important, that sensitive, you need to put it. You have an air gap network. So yeah. Question. Yeah. We got a question. Oh. You know they don't go into that. It's I would love to know. Um, actually, I was hoping that I was hoping that he was here. So you know. <laughs> I mean, if you are like, you know, come tap on my shoulder over the village. I'll be across the way. All who are you looking for? Huh? Who are you? Well, well, who are you looking for? <laughs> like, no, he was talking about the OP. Oh, contractors. contractors. It, was, it was in the report. Oh, those. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, they they didn't talk about that, but yeah, that, that <laughs> I'd love to know as well. Any other? Oh. <laughs> like I said, I I wasn't gonna go into the political aspect of it, but. I'll give you my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. The accountability part of it, like I said, that's that was just another big fail, right? They were yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if yeah. Already the, the credentials of the administrators have right. stolen. Yeah. What's the point? No, it's true. It's true. But I mean, as far as you know, doing the basics, you know, they weren't even doing the basics. That was the point, right? I mean, it's it, it's all it all works together, right? Two-factor authentication, encryption. You're not doing the basics, then everything's gonna fail. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Thanks, everyone. Ron Taylor, everyone. Thank you so much, Ron.